Welcome to our HIPAA Tier 2 training. Because of Pioneer Human Services work in the areas of treatment and reentry, we are considered to be a covered entity which is obliged to follow HIPAA regulations. For this reason, all employees receive some training on the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act and training on how to safeguard protected health information or PHI. This training is called Tier 2 because it includes more detailed information for those who work directly in our treatment and reentry programs who also need to follow part of the Code of Federal Regulations. This training is a part of our compliance program to help increase the protection of our clients' privacy and to stay in compliance with federal and state laws. After completion of this training, you will be able to describe the requirements of HIPAA and other laws related to your work at Pioneer, identify PHI, which stands for Protected Health Information, and your role in protecting PHI, recognize and know how to report violations, and understand that there are penalties related to PHI breaches. So what are the benefits of protecting our clients' health information? Certainly there is a benefit to Pioneer as an organization, a benefit to our clients themselves, and also a benefit to you. Pioneer benefits by maintaining its reputation in the community which in turn helps us to keep our contracts and in the future to win new contracts. It also works to reduce litigation and possible fines. The benefit to our clients is to increase their level of trust in our programs and to enhance the safe environment of our programs. Both of those things help support treatment and positive treatment outcomes. There's also a benefit to you because it's really about protecting yourself and your career, protecting yourself from fines and disciplinary action, as well as maintaining your professional reputation and career growth. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was originally passed because of congressional concerns about the transferability and portability of employees' health coverage. The HIPAA issues that we are currently facing pertain to the transmission of health care information. HIPAA has a privacy rule that establishes national standards to protect an individual's medical records and other personal health information. It has a security rule that establishes national standards to protect an individual's electronic personal health information that is held or transferred in electronic format. And it is also tied to HITECH, which stands for Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act which strengthens the civil and criminal enforcement of HIPAA rules. So let's begin with the privacy rule. The privacy rule safeguards information known as protected health information that can exist in various formats. Protected health information, or PHI, may exist in written format, such as intake forms, notes, or other documents. PHI can also exist in oral or spoken form, such as information shared in a conversation, in person, or on the telephone. PHI can exist also in electronic format, such as in files that are stored electronically and in information sent via email.
HIPAA covers information that identifies the individual or could even potentially be used to identify the individual regarding the individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition, the delivery of health care to the individual, the past, present, or future payment for the delivery of health care to the individual. So what data or information could potentially be used to identify an individual? I'm sure most of you would think right away of a person's name, address, and social security number. But as you can see, the list of potential identifiers is extensive. In fact, it even extends onto a second slide. Whenever possible, we try to de-identify clients to make that potential identification less likely. We may do this by using only last names or removing or using partial identifying numbers, such as the last four digits of your social security number. We would never use a specific address or include physical descriptions or photos. Your program or unit may have other ways that you use to help de-identify clients. The privacy rule also spells out the rights that clients have regarding their PHI, such as the right to have access to their PHI, to restrict its use, and the right to make a complaint if it is used incorrectly. We are required to provide clients with a notice of privacy practices at the time that we first provide services. Pioneer's notice of privacy practices is found on our website. The notice explains how we use and how we share PHI and tells clients their rights regarding their PHI. One rule that is always in play when we are talking about protecting our client's privacy is the minimum necessary standard. The minimum necessary standard requires covered entities like Pioneer to take reasonable steps to limit the disclosure of protected health information to the minimum necessary to accomplish the intended purpose. In other words, PHI should not be disclosed when not necessary. For example, for someone to send a billing statement, they do not need to know the client's diagnoses, but only the client's name and address. We are not allowed to release PHI except with authorization from the client or in limited circumstances as required or permitted by law. These circumstances include to the client's guardian, durable power of attorney for health care, or next of kin if the client is incapacitated, when there is a legal duty to report, such as with child abuse, for treatment, payment, or health care operations, for public health purposes, such as to report births or deaths, and to avoid threats to health and safety. Pioneer has a release of information form and it's found on Pionet. Now we will see shortly that stricter rules about the disclosure of information will need to be followed for people working in chemical dependency programs. If you are, are unsure of what to do regarding release of information, it's your responsibility to proactively seek additional guidance. That means go to your supervisor, go to Pioneer's compliance officers, and ask the questions you need to ask so that you can feel confident that you are following all HIPAA regulations. Here are some things you can do to help protect our clients' privacy. First, keep all client information confidential. 
That information is not to be shared except when conferring with your colleagues in an official capacity. Dispose of client information by placing any written documents in properly designated shredder bins for destruction. That information should never be put into the regular garbage or into a recycle bin. Notify security or your supervisor if you see an unescorted visitor in a non-public area of the facility. And when not in use, lock up files containing PHI. Some things not to do. Never tell anyone what you overhear regarding a client. And this may be information you overhear in your official capacity or things you just happen to overhear. All of that needs to be kept confidential. Never discuss a client in public areas such as hallways, lunchrooms, or an elevator. Do not look up information about friends or relatives. You may have very good intentions. You want to find out how someone is doing in treatment, but this is considered a breach of PHI. Similarly, do not look up information about a client unless it is required for you to do so as a part of your job. And never leave PHI out in an open area. Again, when it is not in use, it needs to be locked up. Please contact your supervisor and the privacy officer if you have any questions or you have any concerns or suspect there has been a breach of information. Now let's look at the security rule, which is about safeguards for electronic or ePHI. And it starts with some very basic things like protecting your own login password. Computers, a pioneer, are a part of a network, and although there are many safeguards in place to protect that network and information stored there, it still begins with you protecting your own password. Now imagine that you have to pick a new password. You want to pick one that is easy for you to remember, but that is difficult for someone else to guess. So which of the following would be the strongest password to choose? One that includes the name of your pet, one that includes the name of your favorite sports team, or one that is based on a phrase? Which one is the strongest? If you said the third one, you would be correct. The third one is the strongest because it contains eight or more characters. It has both upper and lowercase letters. It contains a number and a special character. And as I mentioned, it's based on a phrase that's easy to remember. In this case, the phrase is, take me out to the ball game. Don't use passwords that someone else could easily guess. Think about all of the information that we have about ourselves online, or even information that we have out in the open in our work area, such as pictures or diplomas. It's not too difficult for someone to learn the name of your pet, or to realize that you have a favorite sports team, or the college or school that you attended. So always keep your password confidential, never share it, with anyone, and if you must write it down, store that password in a secure location, not near your computer. We also ask you to practice safe email use. Most of these things have become pretty common sense, but I do believe that they bear repeating. Don't open attachments from senders you don't know, or if they look suspicious. Don't reply to spam. Simply delete it. Double check that the correct recipient has been selected. Then that means that you are sending the email to the person you intend to send it to. And also verify that the person you intend to send it to is authorized to receive that information. 
If sending PHI, remember to de-identify. Currently, our email is not encrypted, so it is crucial that you de-identify any information that you are sending via email. We're going to talk briefly about mobile and external devices. Mobile devices include smartphones and laptops. External storage devices would be something like a USB flash drive. External storage devices should not be used to store PHI, and I'm sure you can pretty quickly figure out why. Those external storage devices are small, they're easy to lose or misplace, and they're easy to have stolen. It is not a secure place to store PHI. And in fact, when we talk about mobile and external devices, the only approved device to use is a Pioneer-issued laptop. All Pioneer laptops have a power on password, automatic log off, and data encryption. Never leave a laptop containing PHI unattended and unsecured. You always need to have it on your person or in a secure location. Let's look at a scenario. A chemical dependency provider leaves her personal laptop, which contains PHI, in the trunk of her car. The laptop did not have a power on password or encryption, and when she returns to her car, the laptop is missing. What did she do wrong, and what should she now do? So first of all, the CDP should not have used her personal laptop. Most people's personal laptops are not encrypted, and certainly not encrypted to the standard that is expected by our IT department. She should now contact the compliance officer and report the loss to her immediate supervisor. And since this was a possible theft, she should report the incident to the appropriate law enforcement agency. If it had been a Pioneer laptop, she should also contact IT. Our contracts state specifically that we are not to use cell phones to access work emails or to store PHI unless they are encrypted. And unfortunately, currently IT does not have an encryption tool for cell phones. So the bottom line is to not use a cell phone to store PHI or read or send emails. Pioneer emails accessed from cell phones are open on the internet and therefore they are unprotected. We also advise sending information through a fax unless the regular mail delivery is not fast enough to meet the client's needs. If you do need to send a fax, use a cover page that includes the confidentiality notice and ensure that you send to the correct fax number. There also is an element of physical security related to ePHI. This means placing computer screens, copiers, and fax machines so they cannot be accessed or viewed by unauthorized individuals or people just walking by. ePHI should only be stored in systems owned by your BHO. If you need to store information on Pioneer's network, please contact IT to find out the appropriate place to do so. As I already mentioned, you should never dispose of PHI in the regular trash. Papers must be shredded or placed in the secured shredded bins. Also, for computers that are no longer needed, hard drives must be electronically shredded using approved software. Simply deleting the data is not adequate. So contact the IT department for specific procedures on how to do this. Persons maintaining notes containing PHI are responsible for protecting that information. This means using minimal identifiers and appropriately securing notes. 
It also means properly disposing of information when it is no longer needed. So let's look at a scenario. An employee leaves her desk to take a lunch break. Paperwork containing PHI clutters her desk. She returns 30 minutes later. Is the employee properly protecting PHI? The answer is clearly no. That PHI is not being properly secured. The employee should secure papers in a locked cabinet or drawer when not being used, and if those papers are no longer needed, they should be properly disposed of in locked shredder bins. I mentioned earlier high tech, which is a law that gives some teeth to enforcing HIPAA laws. This law requires covered entities and business associates to notify individuals, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and in some cases, the media in the event of a breach of unsecured PHI. A breach is simply an unauthorized access, use, or disclosure that's not permitted by the HIPAA privacy rule. Some examples of breaches include a laptop containing PHI being stolen, a receptionist who is not authorized to do so accessing PHI, a nurse accidentally giving discharge papers to the wrong person, or billing statements being mailed or faxed to the wrong individual or entity. You should report all breaches immediately to your supervisor and the compliance officer. This includes all actual or suspected breaches, including breaches of our security system or our computer network. Pioneer has a non-retaliation policy and will not take any retaliatory action of any kind against an employee or against a client who makes a complaint about the misuse of PHI. That is basic information about HIPAA. We are now going to move on to talk about federal laws that come into play for our chemical dependency programs. These are additional privacy laws regarding treatment for drug and alcohol use, and our chemical dependency programs are obliged to follow these laws in addition to HIPAA. 42 CFR Part 2 was enacted in the 70s, and it guarantees stricter confidentiality of information about persons receiving chemical dependency treatment. The privacy provisions in 42 CFR Part 2 were motivated by the understanding that stigma and fear of prosecution could keep someone with substance abuse issues from seeking treatment. And we do not want this to happen. We want people to receive the treatment that they need. 42 CFR Part 2 prohibits the disclosure and use of client records with very, very few exceptions. The primary instance allowing for disclosure is when there is written authorization from the client. Other allowable disclosures include the things you see on the screen, including medical emergencies and crimes on program premises or against program staff. Disclosure is also permitted when there is a court order that meets the specifications of the laws, and we'll talk more about that shortly. These disclosure limitations need to be strictly followed, even if the person seeking the information already has it, or that information is part of public record. And as we will see in a moment, even a subpoena is not adequate reason in and of itself to give out information. As you are likely aware, even the presence or the participation of a client at a facility that is identified as a place where only chemical dependency treatment is provided requires written authorization by that client. 
So let's look at a scenario. You work at a Pioneer Chemical Dependency Program. The daughter of a client calls and asks how her mother is doing. What should you do? The correct response is, I cannot confirm or deny if that person is here. But in addition to that response, you can take down the name and number of the caller and tell that person you'll investigate and may call back if you find out anything. Then if you see a valid ROI for that person, you can confirm their presence and discuss topics that the release allows. At times, 42 CFR Part 2 and HIPAA impose different requirements and sometimes seemingly conflicting requirements. The general rule of thumb is to follow both laws when possible and when not possible to follow the more restrictive law. So let's take a look at some examples and see if you can decide which law should be followed. HIPAA permits disclosure without client consent for the purpose of payments. 42 CFR Part 2 prohibits these disclosures without client consent. So which law do we need to follow, remembering that we should follow the stricter law? In this case, the stricter law is 42 CFR Part 2. HIPAA requires the notice of privacy practices to be given at the time of first service. 42 CFR Part 2 requires the notice must be given at admission or as soon as a client is capable of rational communication. So which do we need to follow? In this case, we need to follow HIPAA, which is the stricter law because first service can happen before the person is on site and may include services that are provided electronically. HIPAA permits a personal representative to sign consent forms on behalf of the client. 42 CFR Part 2 limits who may act in place of the client to those legally appointed the client's guardian. Which do we need to follow? The stricter 42 CFR Part 2. HIPAA allows but does not require programs to make disclosures to other healthcare providers without authorization. 42 CFR Part 2 limits this to medical emergencies only. Which do we need to follow? That more limited 42 CFR Part 2. HIPAA allows healthcare providers to inform family members of the individual's location and condition without consent in emergency circumstances or if the person is incapacitated. 42 CFR Part 2 limits this disclosure to medical personnel only. Which do we need to follow? Again, 42 CFR Part 2. HIPAA permits disclosure about any individual believed to be a victim of abuse, neglect, or domestic violence. 42 CFR Part 2 limits the exception to initial reports of child abuse or neglect. Which do we need to follow? 42 CFR Part 2. HIPAA requires a covered program to give clients access to his or her own health information. 42 CFR Part 2 gives programs discretion to decide whether or not to permit clients to view or obtain copies of their records. Which do we follow? In this case, we follow HIPAA, which is more strict because it requires a program to give clients the information. Now, we also need to follow state laws regarding privacy rights, and no state law may authorize any disclosure that is prohibited by 42 CFR Part 2, but states may impose additional or more strict laws. And an example of this in Washington State is that requirement 
for PHI to be double locked in chemical dependency programs. And double lock means locked in a drawer or a cabinet that is in turn locked in an office or a closet. HIPAA makes no mention of any standards or procedures that a court must follow when issuing a court order. 42 CFR Part 2 has very specific requirements. So again, which do we need to follow? 42 CFR Part 2. A written court order is required before a court can acquire information from a substance use treatment program without consent. And in fact, a program may not turn over any information in response to a subpoena unless the client signs an ROI or there is a written court order. And the grounds upon which a court order may authorize or order a program to make disclosure is very limited. Court orders are granted only when disclosure is needed to protect against an existing threat to life or serious bodily injury or are necessary for further investigation of a serious crime. Let's take a look at another scenario. A pioneer chemical dependency program receives a call from the Attorney General's office stating that they have a writ of habeas corpus for a client at the program. They gave the resident's name to the program and expected action to be taken. What do you do? So first you contact your supervisor and compliance officer and then work with them to obtain the actual court document. Once you obtain that court order, you ask the client to cooperate and to sign an ROI, and then work with law enforcement or court officials regarding the details of the client's departure and arrival at court. As I mentioned earlier, the laws are strictly enforced, including penalizing an organization with fines. An individual may also be fined for inappropriate disclosures of information, and you need to be aware of this, not to scare you, but to really reinforce that the protection of our clients' privacy is a very serious issue. Pioneer also may take disciplinary action against staff that violate our security and privacy policies. If you have any questions or concerns or you believe there has been a breach of information, immediately speak to your supervisor and contact Pioneer's Compliance Officer, Vicki Rush. So that concludes our training. If you wish to receive credit for having attended this training, there are two things you need to do. Go to Pionet, type HIPAA in the search bar, and then click on the link to the HIPAA page. There you will see a link to an online quiz. You must take this online quiz and pass with an 80% score in order to receive credit for having attended this training. And secondly, you will see on that page an acknowledgement form, which you need to print out, sign, and then turn in to your immediate supervisor. You need to do both those things in order to receive credit for this training. All right, thank you, and have a great day.